this week's parasha, the portion of Kedoshim. The Torah begins, Vedaber Hashem on Moshe Leymar. Hashem speaks to Moshe saying, Daber el kol adas b'nei Yisrael. Speak to the entire congregation of B'nei Yisrael. V'marta aleim. And you should say to them, Kedoshim to you. They must be holy. Why must they be holy? Because I, your God, am holy. Therefore, you must be holy. So Rashi will be a site's chazal. We know that every seventh year, no, in the eighth year of the sabbatical year, after the sabbatical year, they have hakel. Mm-hmm. All the Jews, men, women, and children would gather on the Temple Mount, and the king would read the portion of the Chumash Mishneh Torah, the Vorim. That's Hakel. This particular portion of Kedoshim Tiyu was stated in that same public setting. The question is why? Over there, the Torah says exactly why they have to gather men, women, and children. But why? Kedoshim Tiyu, why is that so vital? Somehow that touches upon the essence of Klal Yisrael. So Rashi explains, Melamishdem Parshuzu Bahakel, Neshavov Gufei Torah Tluyim Bo, because the majority of the fundamentals of Torah are dependent on this particular mitzvah of Kedoshim Tiyu. Now the question is, what is Kedoshim Tiyu? What does it mean? You should be holy. So Rashi cites Chazal, or he says his own shot based on what he understands, his own interpretation, because the Ramban disagrees. Kedoshim to you, have prushim in arayos in avera. You should separate yourself from forbidden sexual relations and from sin. Shkol mokom shedamotzi gode erva. Wherever you find that there are boundaries set not to violate sexual Forbidden relationships, atomotzi kedusha. You find kedusha. For instance, isha zonu chalolo, regarding a coin, he's not permitted to marry a woman who's a zona who had a forbidden sexual relation. Chalolo, a woman who was born the seed of a forbidden relationship, not a mamzer, it's for a coin. Ani Hashem kadishchem. Lo yichal zaro. You should not desecrate your seed, your children, your progeny, on the Hashem Kacho, Doshim Tiyu. So we find that wherever this area is observed, we speak about Kedusha. Now, we've discussed this many times, what is Kedusha? What is the meaning of Kedusha? We find that Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, a Kabbalah Satora, when Torah is given at Sinai, that the Jews should not approach the mountain because the mountain is holy, whoever touches the mountain will be put to death. Now, when did the mountain assume a level of holiness? As it says in the Gemara, when God lowered heaven onto earth, when the divine presence came upon the mountain, it became holy. When was the mountain restored to an ordinary state? When the Shekhinah ascended was no longer there. So what is the basis for Kedusha? God is the source of all holiness. So whatever God is associated with, that location is holy. At the burning bush, shal na'alech me'al raglecho, remove your shoes, he called Admas Kodesh. He, it's holy, hallowed ground. So what is holy? Whatever God's associated with. If God detaches himself, it's not. We traveled in the desert for 40 years. We had a Mishkan. When the Mishkan was erected, there were various locations. There was the Holy of Holies, the Covet Sanctuary, the Sanctuary. You, only certain people were permitted to go at certain times of the year. And other people, un, no, not at any time. What about once they dismantled the Mishkan? That desert location, it became ordinary. Why? Because it's only, only within the confines of the Mishkan was the Shekhinah there? Was the Divine Presence there? The moment it was dismantled, it was no longer there. So wherever the Shekhinah is, wherever God's presence is, at that special level, 
it assumes a holy status. We became at Sinai, Mamlechus Koyin of the Goy Kodosh, the kingly priest in the nation, the holy nation, when? When we accepted his Torah. God says, I, I will be your God, you'll be my people. How do we become his people? By accepting the Torah. What's, what's Goy Kodosh? Because there's that special relationship. God dwells in our midst. So what does that engender? God dwelling in our midst. That's Kedusha. Mm -hmm. Right? That, because anything is associated with. So now, if the Torah tells us Kedoshim Tigu. And Rashi explains, we find that means separate yourself from sexual impropriety, from incestuous relationships, from adulterous relationships. What does that mean? That that involvement doesn't allow God to be associated with that particular behavior. We read in last week's portion, you should not do as the Egyptians had done. Ketuavs Mitzrayim, like the abominations of Egypt. Don't emulate their ways. And the land, the location you're going to, Canaan, Ketuavs Mitzrayim. Fatoki or it's also. The land spit them out. The land being the location of Kedusha, of God's presence, it could not tolerate that behavior. All the incestuous relationships, homosexuality, bestiality, all this God says, I will not tolerate it. So the land spit them out. That's what happened. Now, we find that Bilam was commissioned to curse the Jewish people. God did not allow him to curse them. But not only did he not curse them, he blessed them. He failed. So Bilam goes to Bullock, he says, there's one way we can destroy the Jews. Elokeim shall Israel sonim zima. The God of the Jews he cannot, will not tolerate. He detests promiscuity, licentiousness. You get them to sin in this area, it's over. He will reject them. This is the story of the Nosmidjah. But the Balpur. So it was, again, it was the forbidden sexual relations that what? That, that actually activated the Midas Adin, the attribute of justice. 40,000 Jews died in that plague as a result of this. Now, according to the Gemara, and simply Rashi always cites the Chazal, before Hashem offered the Torah to us, He offered it to all the nations of the world. Each one rejected it for his own reason. He offered it to us, we said, Nasim Nishma. We accept it unequivocally. But if you look in the Midrash, the Yalkut, the Yalkut says no. He did not even offer it to the nations of the world. He offered immediately to us. So they came with a complaint and they said, why don't you offer it to us? So Hashem says to the nations of the world, could you prove your legitimate pedigree? He says, my people could, you, could, you, could prove their pedigree. As it says, they brought the documents of pedigree. He says, all you people, you're a bunch of illegitimate people. You come from, from illegitimacy, from adulterous and sexual relationships. Therefore, you're not qualified to accept my Torah, to receive my Torah. My children, they could prove their pedigree and therefore they're qualified to receive my Torah. So the moment they heard this, the nation of the world, they were like astound, astounded. It says, Kamuvonava Yashua. They rose and they actually they they praised her. They praised Klaus. So it's unheard of such behavior. How do you control yourself? So because this area is pure and perfect, therefore we will eligible. you. What does that say? What is illegitimacy? It's a result of what? Of sexual impropriety. Unacceptable behavior. Therefore, they're not qualified because the Torah is the catalyst which allows us. That's the binder. That intertwines us. But you have to be qualified. What happens if you're illegitimate? It doesn't work. So again, we see that wherever there is this failing in our rayos, in sexual misbehavior, it has no relevance to Kedusha. Because the Torah is the basis made us, that was the basis to become the nation of God, to have that relationship with Him, that He dwells in our midst. You see continuously the same point being communicated. We know that during Bayesheni, the only revealed miracle was Hanukkah. The miracle of Hanukkah was the only revealed miracle. There was only one vial of oil, not to put one day, burnt eight nights. But there was another miracle, which was a revealed miracle, not as public, but it was a revealed miracle that if a woman 
sequestered herself with another man. She was a married woman and she was forewarned by the husband. She defies his woman, warning, and the woman claims her innocence. So there's a process. It's the Sota process. And what is she, and she claims she's innocent. She's, the writ of the Sota is obliterated into the water. She swears that she did not commit adultery. She drinks the water. If she committed adultery, what happens to her? She bloats to a point where every artery swells and bursts. And she actually bursts to a point, she becomes dismembered. The adulterer who committed adultery, same thing happens to him. It's a miracle. And if she didn't commit adultery, she's actually, not her health increases, if she wasn't able to conceive. She does conceive, she had ugly children, she has beautiful children, it's the other way. To confirm that she did not commit adultery. It's a miracle. So why did Hashem leave this miracle? We were not worthy of revealed miracles during the second temple period, but this miracle remained in place. Why? So the Ramban says, because the pedigree, to weed out the impurity and pedigree among Jews, that's basic to what? To the profile of the Jewish people. God will not tolerate adultery because that's illegitimacy. So we see again the same thing, that because Kedusha, we to maintain ourselves as the Am Hashem, God's people, we have to be qualified that he could dwell in our midst. But if you have this impurity in pedigree, we're not, we're not the location from to dwell. Therefore, how do you engender Kedusha? Have you Prusha in our eyes. You have to separate yourself and take every, create every fence not to have any relevance to that. The concept of fences is a Torah concept. But factually, all fences are rabbinical. Just read the Pirkei Ovas, Asis Yogla Torah, a person should make fences. Because a person has all kinds of cravings and all kinds of blind spots, and we gravitate to the physical, therefore we have to make fences not to go beyond, not to cross those lines, we make fences. That's what it is. There's a fence, there's a law, there's a Torah violation. Los sikru legalos ervo. You should not come close, I mean, you should not do an act of intimacy, although it's not the actual cohabitation itself, sexuality itself, but other acts of intimacy, because ultimately you will come to commit that forbidden relationship. You'll violate that relationship. This is the only fence which is a Torah fence. The Torah says it. Again, why out of all the fences, Shabbos, which carries the death penalty, the most the, the severe death penalty, skilo, stoning. All the fences are rabbinic fences. When it comes to forbidden sexual behavior, the Torah says no. You can't even enter and do any act of intimacy because that will, could lead. Therefore, we set, ba we set boundaries. We said fences, but why? This, of course, this is basic to a relation with God. A person violates the Shabbos, he violates, he's put to death. But it, this already relates to the essence of what the Jew is. This is the quality of the Jewish people. God says, I will not tolerate that kind of behavior. I'm out of here. I separate myself from you. But if the essence, a Kodesh Baruch Hu says, God says, you might goi kodosh. Goi kodosh means we always were intimately connected to one another. But if this is the way you're going to behave, it can't be, because I will not tolerate it. And that's the reason why, because the Medjur says, when the Jews failed with the daughters of Midjon, the, the nation of the world says, okay, that they've been disqualified now. You said we weren't qualified because the, this area weren't perfect. So they're not perfect either. So Hashem answers, but it says, all those who violated, they died in the plague. So that what remained was, was pure. It was a pure, the pure stock remained. They weed it out immediately. Hashem will not tolerate it. That was Hashem's response to the nations of the world when they said, well, the Jews are no better than we are. What remains are better. They did not cross that line. And the ones who did cross the line, they died immediately in the plague. We find of mitzvos 
that God wants us to emulate his behavior. You should walk in his ways. What do you mean walk in his ways? How do you walk in his ways? Could we be a creator? God's a creator, we should be a creator. So the Gemara says, just as he's gracious, as he's merciful, as he's compassionate, you should also be. That's emulating his characteristics. As he clothed the naked, Odom, after the sin, he clay cooked. You should clothe the naked. He, as he buried the dead, as he buried Moshe Rabbeinu, you should bury the dead. We should emulate his ways. Once discussed, the Gemara says, we know the Torah is so careful not to use words, and it's very concise, not to be superfluous. And there's no such a thing as a word that's superfluous. But yet, when it comes to speaking about the kosher species that Noah was meant to take into the ark, seven of the kosher, two of the non-kosher, so non-kosher species you could refer to as behemoth, the impure species, domesticated animal, or behemo asher enenu tohoro, that is not pure. There are two ways to say it. You can say impure, you can say that is not pure. So the Gemara says, from here we learn, although the Torah is so careful to speak in the most concise way, could have said, behemat meo. What does it say, ashe amen the Torah? From here we learn that when a person speaks, he should speak belosh in the kiyo. That if you can speak in a more refined way, don't speak in a more earthy way. To say contaminated, which has a, a certain connotation, you should speak not refined. In a more refined way, it's not pure. It's a more refined way to say, as we always, I always say over at the Chazun Ish, when he said something wasn't true, you could say it's Sheker, or you'd say Enen Oemes. Enen Oemes, it's not true. Right, same idea. So what do we learn from there? We learn from there that you know you should be a more refined human being. That's not what you learn from there. That's Mahu Avato. As God speaks in a more refined manner, you should speak in a more refined manner. Same idea. This goes into Valach Tuk now, why does God want us to emulate his ways? Why? If we are his people, and he wants to have a relationship with us, what is the basis for any relationship? Compatibility. Mm -hmm. And what's compatibility based upon? Commonality. So the more common aspects that we have in our profile, in our character, there's a greater, we have greater relevance to be compatible with Hashem. Therefore, Hashem says, Valach to you must emulate my ways. That's what Hashem says. Ubo tidbok. God says, I want you to cleave to me. How do you cleave to me? Have relevance, have a relationship with Talmidei Chachomi. Support Talmidei Chachomi. Give them financial opportunities so they should be able to study. Marry the daughter of a Talmud Chacham. God wants you to attach himself. But how can you attach yourself if you have no relevance to him? Kedoshim tiyu. So if God cannot tolerate the way Rashi learns, explains, sexual impropriety, adultery, incest, so how are you Kodosh? Just stay away from that. Right? You can't. Have a prushim in our rayos. But that's, that's kikon shani Hashem elokechem. Why do I want you to be that? Because that's who I am. And if I am, but why, why is the whole, it says the whole Torah the majority of the fundamentals of the Torah are dependent on this mitzvah. Because the moment you're tainted with this, you can do all the mitzvahs, but you have, you have no relation with God any longer. Because as we said, the Kedusha is rooted in God's presence in your midst. But if God is out of here, so what's the good of the mitzvahs? Number of locations we say we supplicate Hashem. Sanctify us with your mitzvos and give us our portion in the Torah. That's what we say. But yet on Yom, Yom Tif we say, You chose us of all na nations. You loved us. You wanted us. 
You sanctify us with the mitzvos. And you brought us close to your service. You sanctified us with your mitzvos. But before we do a mitzvah, what is the text? Asher kiddushon mitzvosa. You sanctify us with your mitzvah, whatever mitzvah we do. So if we, we were sanctified at Sinai with the mitzvah, so if we do the mitzvah, we're sanctified. So what are we asking Hashem? Every shop in Yom Tov, Kachet Mitzvah Sanctify us with the mitzvah, Vesei Chalkei Mitzvah And give us a, a portion of your Torah. This happened at Sinai. This is an automatic. He gave us the mitzvahs. He dashtor mitzvah secho. He sank with your mitzvahs. And once you gave us mitzvahs, now we know what the order is. Now we know how to serve you. The care of Torah Malkin of Mitzvah You've brought us close to serve you, to do your service. So what are we supplicating Hashem? Kachenu mitzvah secho. This goes back to Sinai. It's no, it should be an automatic. Evidently, it's not automatic. What does it depend on? The Rambam says in Hilchus Tshuva that a person who's a Russia, who's evil, before he does Tshuva, what exactly is his status in the eyes of God? He's sonui. He's despised. He's meshukot umetuov. He's disgusting and he's abominable in the eyes of God. Okay? When you do a mitzvah, what does God do with the mitzvah? He throws it back at you. He shreds it. He says, I have no interest in your mitzvah. What happens to a person who's tshuva? He's nechmod, he's ov, he's yokor, he's pleasant, he's beloved, he's precious. And Hashem listens to our supplications. Even before we finish, he's already embraces our supplication to respond. Now, what is the basis to have a relationship with God? What's the basis for Kedusha? God attaches himself to us. As we said, wherever God is, that's where there's Kedusha. He gave us mitzvahs because through the mitzvah now he will come to us. What happens if he takes that mitzvah and he says, he rejects it. He throws it in our face. He shreds it and throws it back at us. God says, you know something? I'm rejecting it. If there's a rejection, there's no basis for God to have a relationship. So what happens if we're, we're not where we should be? So what, it's a problem. God gave us the mitzvahs at Sinai to establish ourselves as the location for Kedusha. That God should dwell in our midst. But what happens if we don't behave properly? God says, you know something, your mitzvahs are abominations. I don't want to have to do with you. The moment he says, I don't want to have to do with you, and he rejects the mitzvah, there's no basis for him to be in our midst. So if there's no basis, there's no basis for Kedusha. The Torah has to have a repository that's holy. So if God accepts the mitzvah, and God is within us, and we're sanctified as a result of the mitzvah, because the Shekhinah is there, so now it's a proper repository, God gives us our portion of Torah. What happens if what? We're not a proper repository. Is God going to give us the Torah? to put it in, in, a, in a location that's not appropriate. We're not an appropriate location. So therefore, we supplicate Hashem and say, Kachin although we're not perfect, we're far from perfect, allow the mitzvah to sanctify us, meaning that you should, because of the mitzvah, you should have a relationship with us. Once you have the relationship, we become the location of the Shekhinah. Then, so now we become the appropriate location for, the, for our portion of the Torah, that you should give it to us. That's our supplication of Kachin Mitzvah Secho, Vesei Chalkei Mitzvah Secho. Kedoshim to you. Kedosh Ami Hashem Elokeichem. Why do I want you to be Kedosh? Because I am Kedosh. There has to be a common ground. There has, there has to be a compatibility. So unless you assume my, pro, my profile, my characteristics, there's no base for a relationship. And since I chose you at Sinai to be the Goy Kodosh and the Mamlechus Kohanim, we have to create that commonality. So therefore, what do you have to do? You can't be involved in something that God wants no association with. That's the way Rashi learns. The Ramban explains it differently. He says, Kedusha is always when you wean yourself from physicality. You 
find that Shlomo says in Mishlei, in Proverbs, Tzadik ochel is open nafsho. But Tzadik only eats to save his soul. He doesn't live, as they say, you know. Do you live to eat or do you eat to live? Most people, they, they border on both sides. Of course, they'll tell you, we eat, we have to live. So what do you take, second, second helpings? And why is the first helping the equivalent of three helpings? <laughs> right? So evidently, there's part of it, you know, part of it is I'm living to enjoy it. Understand? So it's not the physicality to facilitate the spirituality. The physicality assumes its own identity, its own value. We're not saying chas v'shon people are hedonists. Hedonists is over the top. That's what we talk about, like, intellectual animal. The person lives like an animal. And that's what the Ramban says. That's the most extreme level. That's called a maneuver b'shur satora, an unseemly, earthy person where he somehow, he's always skirting all the issues. He eats like hedonists. He has a harem of wives. Everything's permitted. Family purity, everything. But he indulges to, to the maximum. What is that? He's living an animalistic life. Living an animalistic life, you have no relevance to God. You, you're totally a physical being. The objective of a Jew is what? To spiritualize the physical, to sanctify the world, to perfect it. How do you perfect it? We're subject to every ill of a human being, every shortcoming, only because of our physicality. We're not in control of our lives. There's a midrash that says, that compares it, a person who's an expert horseman, rider, he has a stallion, has tremendous power. So when you look at that stallion and you have the rider, you say, well, that stallion is, is leading its rider. The one who knows how to ride that horse, he's in control of that horse. And that's, that's supposed to be the way a human being is supposed to live his life. That we dictate to our physicality. Our physicality doesn't dictate to us at all, whatsoever. For most people, the physicality dictates their lives. What drives invention or advancement in society? Physical needs. Physical needs. Today we work a 40 hour week. One time people worked a 70 hour week. But today we have all the conveniences of life. It's not necessary. So what do we do with the extra time? We invest it in more, more material. And if you have more time, so maybe not to create material, but more leisure time. And what do you do during leisure time? What do you address? Do you address your intellectualism? Or do you do, you invest it in what? Doing acts of, of kindness? Again, indulgence. More indulgence, more indulgence, more indulgence. Why? Because that's the reality of human being. A human being is what? Every animal, animalistic instinct and craving and drive is within the human being. So unless somehow it's harnessed and it's sanctified, the animal leads the person. You're, it's, a, it's an addiction. You're addicted to it. Every human being is addicted to his phys physical needs. So how do we become, how do we detox? By spiritualizing the physical, so the element that draws us to the physicality is no longer there, because it's been sanctified, it's been purified, it's less earthy, it's the earthiness that leads, leads you there. A person has an affection in his body. Affection takes the system down. What about if you conquer the infection? You destroy the bacteria. The body functions healthily. The earthiness of the body takes the person down, causes you to behave and live and process everything within a certain context. How do you extricate yourself from that? There has to be a metamorphosis. What brings about that metamorphosis, that change, that transition, that you become a different being? The mitzvos, that's the spiritualization. Asher kitshon mitzvosov. God gave us mitzvos to sanctify ourselves, that purifies that detoxes, that brings about that transition from the physical to the spiritual, it becomes a different reality, a different entity. Therefore, you're not subject any longer, although we always have some degree of inclination, negative, 
but basically we're in a position to take control. Without that, you are not in a position to take control whatsoever. You're out of control. So Chazal, Chazal tell us that that Chachomim, the person who's a Chochom, the Talmud Chochom, Torah sage, Ke maskinim mischakmin. As they get older, they become wiser. And I'm Oretz, the person who's Nigan Ramis doesn't study Torah. As he gets older, they become more foolish. The Chochem becomes wiser, and the ignorant person becomes even more foolish. Why? That's the reason. We're saying that a person who's truly, let's say, an alcoholic, a drug addict, literally his body is so dictated by the addiction, he can't live like a responsible human being. He can't. It's not possible. Even for the sake of survival, survival is the strongest instinct in a human being. The alcoholic, the addict, he's totally off. Even, so, even the, the, the instinct of survival has no relevance to him. But let's say a person is a hedonist, or he, he's dictating control by his physicality. If it comes to a question of survival, he's gonna do what he has to do. It, it could be because it's linked to that. Because since he wants to, live high on the hog, or live, continue living, therefore it's not contradictory to his hedonism or to his craving for, for physicality. Because he's doing that for that reason itself. That's why he takes control. So let's say a person is young. He's younger. He has a family. He wants to get married. He understands. Unless he assumes, certain, although he'd like to sit around and do nothing and just enjoy and indulge, but reality, it can't be forever. Therefore, he has to be responsible. So, understanding that, he becomes responsible. So, even though he's a fool, the necessity causes him to become wise. What happens if a person gets old? And he's no longer, he doesn't have the physical capacity or the mental capacity to be responsible. Right, what happens? What happens to him then? He becomes more foolish. Because now that he doesn't have that element of assuming responsibility, what draws him, what dictates his life? It only his needs. So as he gets older, because he's not able to draw from that responsible component, because he's not able to, so he only gets more foolish. Now, a person who's a chocham, a person who spiritualizes his life, that he took the physicality and he brought about the metamorphosis. So therefore, the earthiness of life has much less relevance to him. He takes control of his life. But, but, but fact, fact, factually speaking, he has physical drives. He's still, a, he's still a human being. He still has to contend with a very serious Yitzhahara, evil inclination. What happens as he gets older? So that evil inclination blurs his ability and it's an impediment to become more spiritual. What happens as he gets older? And that evil inclination starts waning because the chemistry is no longer the same. His physicality is no longer the same. So what's left? His spirituality. So therefore the Chacham, as he becomes older, he becomes more spiritual. The Schachmen, they become more wise, they become wiser. Because now they have new levels of clarity which they didn't have before because there was always a level of interference between the physical and the spiritual, even at the minimal level, there was this contradiction between the two. So the concept of Kedoshim to you, Kaddish is atzmoch b'mutoloch, sanctify yourself with something that's permitted, wean yourself, partake of the physical to a minimal level. Mark tells us in two locations, that Dovet HaMelech initially had no evil inclination. I mean, because he actually destroyed it. He took so, such control of his life. He said, Libi cholol bikirbi. My heart, my lave, is cholol, is, is dead within me. He actually destroyed his evil inclination. But then he says to God, I want to be tested. I want to be contested because Hashem says mm -hmm. to be able to be classified as a Luke David 
you have to withstand the serious tests. Like Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov, each of them had their tests. So he said to him, so he didn't tell him exactly what it was going to be, but he understood it would be in the sexual area. And this is why he failed with Bathsheba. But again, so what did he do? David had 18 wives, 17 wives at the time. And he figured the more he indulges in cohabitation, procreation, the less control it will have over him. It's like a person years ago, you know, you wanted to stop smoking, he'd smoke to a point where he barely could breathe. So he'd be so disenchanted with it, he'd stop smoking. That's the way he'd break his habit of smoking. So by fully satisfying his sexual need, he'll be able to withstand even the greatest temptation in the area of, of sexuality. But he made a mistake, the Gemara says. Because the Gemara says, Yesh Eva Kotn Ba'odon. There's one small organ in the human body. Kishemario Masbio. When you starve it, you save it. And when you save it, you starve it. That the more you engage, the more you want it. The less you engage, you weak, the less you want it. See, he didn't, he, David made that mistake. He didn't know that reality. And therefore, by being involved to a greater degree, this increased his desire, and that's why he failed with Bathsheba. That's the Gemara. Or in Sanhedrin, or in Sukkah. Okay? So again, what is it? Havi Prushim and Arayus. This area is an area, it's, it's literally, it's addictive to the point where actually, Over here, this is Sepharno. He speaks about Kadoshim Tiyu. He says something beautiful. Firstly, there's a Midrash that the Midrash shows in this week's Parsha that there is a corresponding factor to the Aser Sativros. Whatever you find in Aser Sativros, you find correspondingly speaking, there is there are mitzvahs in this week's Parsha. Why did he say this portion in the presence of all Klal Yisrael? Why? Speak to the Jewish people. Why do all the Jews have to be present? Because all the Aseris Dibros are included in this particular parsha of Kedoshim. Ketzad. Where, how do we see the corresponding factor? First of the, of the Ten Commandments. That's what it says. False gods. Don't turn towards idolatry. You're not permitted to pronounce the name of God in vain. You're not permitted to swear in God's name falsely. Observe the Shabbos. You have to revere your father and mother. It says you're not permitted to commit murder. If you see your fellow Jew drowning or in a situation of He's, he's going to die. If you can't intervene, you have to save his life. It says you're not permitted to commit adultery. It says in this week's portion. Bearing false testimony. You should not be a talebearer. The person withholds payment from an employee, stealing. That's lo What does the person steal? Because he wants to have what somebody, what somebody, somebody else has. Hare kol aseres adibros klulim beparsha lekaksiv kol adas. Just as the aseres adibros was said to all the Jewish people in their presence, identically here, 
That's the reason why it had to be Bahakel. All Jews had to be present. Of course, this corresponding factor. So this portion is the equivalent of Kabbalah Satora. That's what it is. It's encapsulated in, in, the, in, the, in these four, few psukim over here. Now, he's, the Sifono says something beautiful over here. He says, there are two mitzvahs. There's a mitzvah of Kibir Ovein, and there's a mitzvah of what? Of Ishim of Ov of Tira'ok. There's honor and there's reverence. Honor your father. What's honoring? So Rashi cites the Gemara. Honoring is feed your father and mother, provide for food, for drink, clothing, assist them, help them put on their coat, take off their coat. That's honoring the father and mother. What's revering? One doesn't sit in, in, their, in, their, in their location, their seat. One doesn't speak in their presence without permission. One doesn't contradict what they say. That's reverence. Because revering means, I see how special, who am I to, to, to say a word, to offer an opinion? That's reverence. So he says something beautiful. If I'd only have the Dibros, the Gemara says they could be a person who feeds his parents the pheasant and the choice best wines. And it's a total disrespect. Because he does it disrespectfully, begrudgingly. So what's the good if that's honoring the parent? But what about at a person who feeds his parents all he could, but he does it with the greatest respect. Just bread and water, because he can't do more. That's truly honoring the parent. So you could do something, materially speaking, it's a different class, but you know something, it's not, it's not proper honor. You're not honoring your parents properly. So how do you guarantee, what's the supplement to honor to guarantee that it's done on the most advanced level of respect? if you revere your parents. If you revere your parents, then the level of honor that you can accord them is a different level of honor. If you revere them, then you see them special. If they're special, so whatever you do for them, you do it in the most special way, the most respectful way, to your best ability with the greatest level, level of sensitivity. So therefore, those ishim of of tiro complements kaveri sovich v'simecho. Each one complements the other. But he explains what is this all about? What is this all about? So the Sivaro says, After God had allowed his presence to dwell in the Jewish people, to sanctify them forever, that we should have a share in eternity. What, what is Olam Abba? Olam Abba is what? is having a relationship with God. That's what all of my boys, as it says, you, you benefit from, from the radiance of the presence, whatever that means. Mishnah tells us in the that a koras ruach of all of Habo, just a whiff of the world to come, is more than all the pleasures of this existence from the first moment to the last encapsulated in one moment. That's only a passing glance at it. So what is true, Olam Abba? We, have, we, we cannot fathom what that is. But that's Olam Abba. So when God gave us, the, he sanctified us with a sanctity, L'chai Olam, forever. But again, what's Chai Olam? Eternity. But what is, what is the sanctity? What is sanctity, as we explained? It's that we're, we're, we're a people, that we are qualified to be the location of the Shekhinah. Because wherever God is, that's where sanctity is. That's Kedusha. The moment God departs from that, there's no longer sanctity there. Which was the original intent of creation. That's what Hashem says in Sinai. Why did He take us out of Egypt? Just to be free of, of a master? That's why he took us out of Egypt. As we said, before we Avdi Paro, now we're Avdi Hashem. We were the slaves of Paro, now we are God's servants. He removed us from the impurity of the desires 
and zera, what has to do with procreation. Ketumas hanido, had the goy, mem nishoch nimenu, ketumas hazova, all, he goes and enumerates. Ka'omro, what is Yom Kippur we read last week? Bikol chatosech lefnei Hashem titoru. He wants us to be purified from all our sins. What does sin generate? Impurity. So he wants us to be relieved of that impurity, lefnei Hashem. If you fnei Hashem, it has to be titoru. You have to be purified of that. Says, what is the intent of why God prohibits all these to us? We should be holy. To be reflect God to the best possible best possible way. Which was the intent. Let us make let, let us make man. In our form and our image, an image in our form. You should have a semblance of who I am in thought and in action. To achieve and assume whatever level of what of comparison to myself. We have to now. We have no idea who God is. All the appellations of Hashem, He's Rachum, Chanun, Yud Gimel means a Rachum. Is that His essence? That's not His essence. We have no idea what God's essence is. Whenever we speak about God's mm-hmm. characteristics, that's only the way He relates to this existence. He created a world with an objective. To achieve that objective, He assumed a certain profile. That's a profile in how He acts, but what He is, we have no idea what He is. The morale says, there's only one thing we know about God, that he's Echot. Outside of Echot, we have no idea who he is. What he is, what his essence is, we have no idea. We know he's infinite, he's perfect in the absolute state, concept. But what he, we have no idea. That that he interacts with us at various levels, he chose that. And we say in the Shemona Esra, we say, Hokel HaGogol HaGiva Vanoro. What do we say? Kel el God is merciful. He's acts with the attribute of judgment and rachmim. Chesed din rachmim. Kel el But who is he? He's kel el He's above it all. That's only the way he's interacting with this existence. So if we want to be mizdamalo, we want to have a relationship with him. What do we have to do? If we don't know who he is, what do you do? Like you meet a person, you say, a uh, person that has a uh, lahavdu, you want to be a, a proper host. A person's coming. A person of a special quality person. Status, a king. You have to find out what, what he likes, what he dislikes, what he wants, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. But what about, you don't even know, there's no way to even to figure out what he is or who he is. Could you prepare properly? There's no way to prepare. So if we have to create a commonality between ourselves and Hashem, how do we create that commonality to be able that we can cleave to Him? So He has, he has to provide us with, with, a, with a menu, with a prescription of how to live our lives. By doing these various things, what does it engender? What does it establish? What does it create? It creates that commonality. But why? The chukim, statutes. We have no idea. You say, you know, a person has to breathe oxygen. Why? We have no idea why. The way God created us, and we have lungs. A, a human being cannot breathe under the water. A fish could. Why? Because that's the way God created us. So God says, they hook in the statues. We have no idea. You're not permitted to cook milk and meat. If you do, you're not permitted to eat it. You're not permitted to benefit. Why? We don't need why. That's just a reality. If you want to establish a spirituality which has a commonality with God, to be able to be the location for his presence, you just gotta follow the prescription. That's the way it is, that, that's the answer. There's no other answer. So all that he's talking about now, Kadoshim to you, now, to be Kaddish, what do you do? A through Z. It's not even the way we process it. Why should you steal? Because you're an unethical person. You're an unethical human being, therefore what? So what about killing? I, don't, I wouldn't even go to, to, to war because I'm a conscientious objective, objective. 
you know something? But God says, when you go to war, you kill. And it's a mitzvah to kill, because to preserve human life, self-defense is a mitzvah. It's an obligation. Well, I thought killing is evil, because it's evil to kill. No, that's no. It's evil to kill when it's, when it's what? For no reason. But if it has reason, it becomes a mitzvah. But why? Because God says so, that's why. So again, all these things, you don't have to understand. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have any answers. If you understand what the value of mitzvahs are, negative, positive, statutes, whatever they may be, paraduma doesn't make a difference. If you want to have a relationship with God, that you should be the location to be kadosh, you just follow the prescription. You want to have a, a piece of eternity. To be that, in his image and his form, how do you do it? Follow his prescription. The end result will be that. That's what it is. And that's how we, the Sephora explains the whole parasha. Every one of these things plays into this. If you're building a profile, you're creating an entity known, known as Salmenu to Musenu. And if you understand that, there's no basis to say it doesn't make sense. If God said it, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. That's the way it's done. You know, you have a combination on a vault. And there's enough money in that vault that you can support all humanity. But you have, you have to know the combination. But why? Why can't I choose any num and spin it and turn it? And why doesn't it open? Because that's not reality. Because the way the vault is set, the combination, you have to you have to know which numbers to come upon. That's the only way you open the vault. The only way you create this reality is you have to do what he says. Otherwise, you're creating your own reality. It's not that's not reality. The end result is something else. You buy something and there's instructions how to put together the computer with all the components. You say, but why? Why can't I do it? I'm a pretty smart person. I'm a genius. I'm a high tech guy, but you have no understanding of where this computer operates. You understand? It's not working. It's not gonna work. But why not? Because you were given instructions exactly how to put it together, how all everything fits and it works together. That's the way it is. Torah Judaism is identically the same thing. It's not what I feel. It's not ethical moral because I'm an ethical moral human being though. You're ethical and moral when you follow what God wants. Then you're ethical and moral. Otherwise, you're unethical and you're immoral. That's the reality. And that's exactly what this parsha is about. Kedoshim Tiyu, Kodesh Ani. What I want you to be holy, because you and then we have a relationship. Now how do you do it? Read the Torah. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm.